News Radio 840 WHAS. Good Sunday morning, Bob Sikoler and the Louisville Real Estate Show. I own a team over at REMAX Properties East, and we are continuing to knock the ball out of the park, so to speak. We just need listings to continue. So they'll give you my number in a second. First, let me introduce some great folks who are joining us for today's show. Randy Rocky from Swan Financial. You can reach Mr. Rocky anytime at 6450736. Also here, Kevin Disler, Pitt and Frank attorneys. You can pick the attorneys you want to close your loan. And I cannot suggest a better group of people than Pitt and Frank attorneys at 8959900. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning, all. Yes, indeed. Good morning, Bob. Son Greg is uh, actually working already this morning, so we won't hear from him this morning. You can reach me anytime uh, on my cell phone at 502-376-5483. Again, 376-5483. Following up to a story we've been following, a tragic story out of Florida, Surfside, Florida, condo collapse, has apparently now led to diminishing demand for condo units in older buildings prior built prior to 2000 that's along the city's coastline uh, reports nbc put out something on this it's going to be more common at least for a while the fear of going into an older building is going to be greater and buyers are going to be more careful and sensitive to the history of repairs and maintenance so that's unfortunate next uh, topic uh, for the in the news a uh, weekly mortgage refinances is spiking randy rocky over at swan spiking 20% after interest rates drop to uh, lows that we haven't seen since February. What are you tracking from your perspective? Yes, we're, we're definitely back up um, uh, from, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I, I do think that, I mean, I, I don't know how long this train is going to continue, but I did tell you, uh, you yeah. know, uh, that Barry B told, uh, did say that, he thinks by uh, this year that we're not we're, uh, rates are going to move a little bit up and down, and we're really seeing that cycle so far. So, again, kudos to him. He's been amazing yeah. since 2003. I followed him. And when you say back up, you're talking about the number of applications, not loan rate or mortgage rates. You're talking applications. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, well and, and, and you are correct. And and, yeah. and but the one thing is, is they kind of correlate sometimes together. Yep. So, you know, rate, when rates are down, then obviously refinances for sure go up. Yep, understood. Uh, the the uh, number of applications, yes. Uh, Kevin Dissler, are you seeing more refinances come through your doorway? Because it seems like I would have thought that most people who are going to refi their home if they had a higher uh, mortgage rate from years past would have done it already. But according to this, uh, it's back up again. How about you? We, we had the rates kind of spike up for a couple months, and they kind of did uh, tend to reduce the number, but the rates went back down again, kind of the surprise yeah. of everyone except Randy and uh, Mr. B. But uh, yeah. we're seeing a lot of people come back in. Well, and the other thing is people are doing cash out refis again, where the prices of their homes have gone up so much yes. in the last couple of years that you can really use your equity in your home in order to finance improvements. But isn't that how we got in trouble with um, back in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, where we saw people cashing out? I guess they didn't have as much equity uh, in the home then as they do now. And I suspect at least that mortgage companies are a bit more um, careful about doing these refis. Uh, right, right. And uh, the debt to income ratio is, is really... Uh, been, uh, we verify that a lot more than we used to. Yeah. Uh, we know there was a lot more stated income programs uh, back in the day around the 2008 mark. Um, and, and it's really it, just like you, like Kevin said, there's, there's a lot of people for, for whatever reason are doing, you know, their home improvements or they getting credit card debt and with the appreciation. Yes, there is a tremendous amount of cash out refinances happening. We were just talking the other day about is this another 2007 situation? And just recalling back in those days when we did closings, you all remember like the 80 20? Yeah. Where the primary lender would borrow, you could borrow 80% and 20% mm -hmm. with a home equity loan. And no lenders are doing that. They really have, I think, learned from the, the mistakes back in 08. So the lenders are not allowing people to over leverage any longer. And that's a good thing. It really is. Uh, that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, interesting that apparently monthly mortgage payments, according to a new survey, have increased uh, to $1,204. That's the average. 
That's a 20% jump compared to a year earlier. And they're attributing all that because the price of homes have gone up. People are paying more for them and the interest rates um, are lower, but they're just buying more home. They're able to afford a bigger home that's raising interest, uh, increased payments on a monthly basis. Uh, the other thing about that is property tax are going up, you know, mm. uh, because mm-hmm. of the fact of the appreciation. Yeah. And well, not only because of appreciation, I think you're referring to um, uh, the fact that there have been a number of assessments around town, PVA, Property Value Administration, going out and reassessing and become shocking a lot of people with their new uh, tax bill, which uh, is unfortunate. So I don't know what to uh, to advise other than you can try to attempt to at least uh, fight it. A real estate agent that can give you comps from the area that might be able to help you. For those of you who'd like to see what our show looks like, because, hey, we, we put this on YouTube, you can go to LouisvilleAnswers.com. That's LouisvilleAnswers.com. If you want to see what people are saying about us, head over to LouisvilleSellersTalk.com. You can read about what we're saying, our reviews. Go to LouisvilleZillow.com. Okay, so some new terms have uh, appeared in listings. Uh, you know, when we write a listing, when we put it out there, we try to be creative to some level of uh, describing a home. And so the new terms that are not so creative but are being used more frequently, guys, are words like large, great, full, and spacious. They were among the most commonly used words to draw home buyers to real estate listings over the past year as spaciousness grew more important in the pandemic. That's according to a new study. A research team examined 43 million words from more than 640,000 listings nationwide. They identified trends and compared findings from the 2019 analysis to see how most popular keywords have changed since the pandemic. You know, things like, and you guys will all identify with this, granite countertops, hardwood floors, stainless steel appliances. Those were really the big terms that we used to use to attract attention. But now it's things like large, great, even parking or garage. Because people have found that if they can park their car, they can put their car somewhere, then they can go and use their car even during a pandemic and feel safe. I thought that was kind of interesting. All right, moving on. Johnny writes, my agent wants me to remove the inspection contingency on the home that he writes an offer on, a contract on next week. Apparently, he's written a number of offers and they've failed. And so he's wondering does removing the inspection contingency create a problem? Is that okay? Kevin, let's start with you from a legal standpoint. What are your thoughts? I think it is a problem. You have a lot of buyers that just believe that in order to get a contract accepted, they have to give up things that generally the due diligence that you normally would have. And on inspections, I'll mention one without mentioning names. Um, They waive the inspection, got in the contract. Find out termite damage, probably thirty to fifty thousand dollars in that situation, and contractually oh, they wow. would be obligated to close, except for the fact that they had a financing contingency on it. But in order to get a contract, people are giving up some of their due diligence. What I would prefer to do is that you can inspect it, but you don't just do not have a right to request any repairs. A short period of time, thumbs up, thumbs down. It works for you and it works for the seller, but otherwise you're subjecting yourself to really unlimited liability. If you don't have an inspection at the very least. Yeah, you can always waive repairs and just retain the right to delete or cancel the contract, I suspect, right? Right. Yeah. Correct. Another contingency that you need to be concerned about not removing from an offer, because let's face it, here's what's happening, folks. There's so many people looking for homes, and there's so few homes out there that what we're seeing is buyers doing anything they can to purchase a home, including removing specific contingencies like a home inspection. And so people are fighting over each other and maybe the one that doesn't have a inspection inspection wins, but as Kevin points out appropriately that you're opening yourself up to some major problems. Once you move into the house, another contingency and Randy, this is where we come to you on this is the financing contingency. 
Can you remove legally? So I'm going to come back to you in a minute, Kev. Can you remove a financing contingency if it goes through a mortgage company? And if you do remove it, will it come back to bite you? Because ultimately, the financing contingency protects the bank, and they're going to be looking at you as the buyer. Randy, thoughts? Uh, I, th I think that you can't, and I think what you need to do, what we are starting to do with your team, Bob, a lot is call them the listing agent and mm -hmm. tell them, hey, we've done all the due diligence, and and we're and this person is ready to buy a home. So that that to me is, I don't think you can remove the contingency because if they can't close the home, they're just not going to be able to close it. Yeah, and legally, Kev, if you remove the financing contingency and the mortgage company doesn't approve you that puts you in breach with no out you're in breach and, and you probably would forfeit the good faith deposit and most sellers are requesting a healthier good faith deposit these days it basically effectively makes it a cash transaction if you can't come up with the cash by the last day of mm -hmm. close you're in breach and you're going to lose your deposit another a ten, a contingency that is somewhat concerning is the appraisal contingency where you waive the appraisal, yet it's still subject to a lender appraising it. And, Randy, I think we have the same problem there with both lender and illegal it if you remove the appraisal contingency, correct? That is correct. And and if they can't, it's say, for, uh, for example, they're putting 5% uh, putting, uh, down, and that's the program that they're, they're approved for, and they can't do a 3% down because they're not a first-time home buyer and some other things, and they're involved in that. So now they're on a two hundred thousand dollar home. They're putting ten thousand down, and the appraisal comes in at a hundred and ninety. Okay, they got to come up with that extra ten thousand dollars, or you guys got to negotiate that price down. And uh, yes, it, it's, it's causing uh, in certain situations some issues, but we seem to be working through them and navigating them very well. And I think that there's a lot to do with the uh, you know our professionals. Yeah. They're realtors. I mean, they're do you guys are doing a really great job navigating these borders right now because they're not easy. They, they can be done, but it, it is uh, it is a little bit challenging at times. One of the things that we're finding that works, rather than removing the appraisal contingency, which Kevin, you agree that that lays you in the same path of a moving train as the, removing a financing contingency. Am I right? That's correct. Like so ultimately, you have to come up with the money, and a, and a savvy listing agent is going to say, "Okay, assuming it doesn't appraise, show me that your client has the cash, or you don't get the property." Mm -hmm. uh, most agents on the buy side, you'll say you waive the appraisal, but you will limit or cap how much your client has to come out of pocket. Because again, if you waive it, you you know it may be wide open as far as your liability, or you're going to be in breach and lose your deposit. One of the things that we're finding successfully works is an appraisal guarantee. So let's just say a house is listed at, let's use Randy's number, 200000 and you go in and you have a um, an offer of 225000 which quite frankly, folks, is not so unusual this, this year. And you, in the contract, and Kevin, just uh, follow this, you put a, an appraisal um, guarantee that, the buyer will pay the seller ten thousand uh, dollars between the appraisal price and contract price. So, in other words, if it only appraises for two hundred and ten thousand dollars, the uh, a buyer puts in ten thousand, which brings it up to two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. It's a guarantee, and that's still safe, as far as we're concerned, right? Yeah, it's basically it's a cap. It's risking your client's exposure. Plus, the, the seller knows that you can come up and, and, and knows ex and, and should actually ask, ask to verify where the funds will be coming from. But it's a good way for both buyer and seller to be assured that the transaction comes through because property is appreciating so fast, the appraisers are really having trouble keeping up with it right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which also brings, Randy, the question because of this guarantee, when you look at, and we've talked about this, but when you look at these um the uh, specifics of a buyer's ability to purchase, you have to factor in if there is a guarantee that that guarantee is not included in the money that's being used for a, a down payment or for approval for a loan, right? Uh, that, that is correct. And, yeah, and yeah. you know, we have to have the backup money. So uh, if, if the appraisal doesn't come in at the value. So some other contingencies you should never remove is a mold remediation. 
which is not so prevalent here in the Louisville area, but it does exist. And then a well water or septic inspection, also some key components. Um, surprisingly, there are people who might consider waiving the septic inspection, but if uh, you have a problem, you, you are definitely going to need septic, so don't do that. Uh, you have the inspection, don't waive it, and then retain the right to terminate the contract if, in fact, the deal falls apart. We are going to take a break. When we come back, a variety of things, including some great news for home buyers and builders. We'll give you the story on that. With us, Kevin Disler, Pitt & Frank Attorneys, 895-9900 is Kevin's number. Randy Rocky at Swan Financial, 645-0736. You can reach me anytime. Greg's off on uh, working already this morning, but you can reach me at 376 54 Eight three again three seven six five four eight three. We are back in a moment on News Radio eight forty W H A S. News Radio eight forty W H A S. Bob Sakola, the Louisville Real Estate Show. Thank you, Barbara Corcoran, for your endorsement and friendship. You can see Barbara on Shark Tank over on ABC as well as on CNBC and reruns. We are blessed to have Kevin Disler from Pitt and Frank Attorneys with us at eight nine five nine nine zero zero. Also, Randy Rocky, Swan Financial, 645-0736. And again, son Greg is uh, working already this morning. All right, some good news for buyers and for builders. Lumber prices have dived more than 40% last month and the biggest monthly drop on record. Lumber futures have tanked uh, 42% in June alone on pace for their worst month, which is good news, on uh, record dating back to 1978. Now, that's great news on the surface, but guys, here's the real problem. I was talking to a builder this week, and he was telling me that even though the price of lumber has gone down, there are a lot of lumber warehouses and storage companies and places that sell to builders that have already bought lumber at the higher prices. So they got to get rid of that stock before we'll see in the consumer side any of those prices coming down. So that's unfortunate. New survey of... Where would you want to retire? Now, some would say Randy Rocky has already found his favorite place to retire. Randy, where where would you want to retire down the road? Uh, I would like to retire in Glasgow, Kentucky and Tampa, Florida. Oh, there you go. All right. How about you, Kevin? I think Any it, place? Gets down, it gets down to Florida, the hills of North Carolina, or the mountains of Colorado. Interesting. We're still trying to figure out which one. I, I would say I think I, I visited Marco Island in Florida, and I'm seriously thinking, well, yeah, that might be a place to go. So there's a new uh, survey out as baby boomers are looking to retire. Where would they likely move to? The location most picked was not brought up by all of us. It is Georgia. It may offer, I know we're all surprised, right? Georgia? Right. It may offer the best prospects, according to a new study by Bankrate. The state's overall affordability is a big draw to retirees, offering a low cost of living and light tax burden. Those same reasons helped Florida and Tennessee nab the number two and number three spot, respectively, on Bankrate's retirement uh, locales. All right. So where did Kentucky uh, – sorry, uh, Indiana is on this list as well. Let's start with Kentucky. First, where did they rank of the top 15 places to retire? Well, number 10, which is really not that bad, which, you know what that means, folks? We don't have to do anything. We just stay right here and, and live living a, a nice life. And incidentally, not to be outdone at uh, number 10, Indiana came in at number nine. Again, this is bank rate. So if you're living in Kentucky or well, Indiana, yeah. You know, and I, I sincerely, Bob, there's a lot of people that down here at the lake at Barron. I mean, my next door neighbor's from Detroit. The other one's from Illinois, you know, Michigan. I mean, there's a, there are a lot of people that do relocate here from the north. Yeah, and I, I think that this is a – I was always told uh, for years when I first moved here to do TV that this is a big little town. You know, it feels big city, but you've got the, the friendliness of – um, and convenience of a little town. And I still agree with that. For the most part, it really is. A question that came up, and I think everyone needs to, um, to think about, Barney had uh, sent in a, an email. And again, we're doing our COVID show. So it sounds a little funny, just to let you know. We're doing this on, recording it on Zoom. 
and then we're uploading it to YouTube. So if it sounds a little funky, it sounds to me funky today. I'm not sure what's going on. But you can go over and see the actual video recording at louisvilleanswers.com. That'll redirect you to our YouTube channel. But Barney had sent in a, a question about his credit report. He says he had checked it and there were some mistakes he found and wondered how easy is it to get those corrected. And Randy, I should point out, I did a little research on this. and Apparently more than a third of Americans say they have found at least one error in their credit report. That's according to a new report from Consumer Reports. Uh, the publication actually asked more than 5,800 study participants for a copy of their credit report and check it for errors between February 1 and April 1. So what can we do if we first check our credit report and then find out, Randy, that there's a problem? Well, uh, the, what, what we have been doing is we send a credit report to the consumer and then they say, hey, here's the issue. And then there are a couple of things they can do. They can either get a credit repair company to call, and that's that's uh, about a four to $500 cost. Or what we can do is give them directly to TransUnion, Equifax, or Experian, and they call them directly, and uh, they correct the error with them. And they're a lot more open to that now. Uh, oh. uh, they know there are errors, and they want, they, they want to help the consumer a lot more than they used to, the three major credit bureaus. I'm uh, moving on now with some more emails. And by the way, if you want to get a question to us, uh, send me an email, bob at we sell louisville.com. And uh, we will try to get to you. We got a stack of people. In fact, I got a call from a listener last week who wanted to get a question on the air. And I said, send me an email. And I don't know that I received it. So again, bob at we sell louisville.com subject line radio question, and then put the uh, question in the, in the body of the email um karen wrote in he said she says i've heard about you talk about this problem before but i never expected to be involved in the problem we have our house listed and we accepted an offer on it kevin another buyer who saw the home just asked if we could accept an offer that would bring us twenty thousand dollars more in profit and this is not unusual folks this is happening on a regular basis where uh the homes are so scarce you may accept a contract, and then all of a sudden another one comes in for more money. In this case, Karen says $20,000. She says, what steps do we need to go through to get rid of the first offer? Kevin, from a legal perspective. To get rid of the first offer, it sounds like they were approached by the person submitting the second offer about, okay, yeah. hey, Bob has a contract to buy Randy's property. Bob, I'll, I'll pay you $20,000, and you assign that purchase contract to me. No, uh, no, 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 because this buyer didn't go to the, to the first, the second buyer didn't go to the first buyer. The second buyer is waving the money in front of the seller and the Ooh. seller wants the extra 20,000. I have the answer for you. So legally that you're going to tell me there's nothing she can do. She's locked into a contract, right? That's correct. But you can also negotiate. You can negotiate. Yeah, it's going to be a tough negotiation. So here's the only thing I can think of to tell Karen, and that is when it comes to the inspections, no matter what they ask, your answer is no. Now, they can move on or they can accept the house you know, the way it is. But other than that, there really isn't any other recourse for you to get rid of buyer one. And I just want to confirm that with you, Kevin. There, you know, usually there's always going to be a request for something. And as yeah. long as there is any reason whatsoever, you can, you can deny it and get out of the contract. However, there's yeah. always an obligation on the part of the seller to work in good faith. So you, you have to be somewhat careful that you document that there is a quote unquote reason why you rejected it. And, you know, your hope is that they ask you to caulk the sink. And you say no. And, and, <laughs> yeah, they'd be stupid to pull out on that, right? Yeah. Yeah, but but the buyer hopefully will be well advised and say that anything that is not material, let it go. And that's a mistake you see a lot of buyers make. All right, one final question from Carl and Randy and Kevin. Just FYI, we know you're not a tax accountant, so I'm not sure we have the answer to this. But Carl wrote and he said, so which expenses can be used to reduce the net amount I receive for sale for tax purposes. So in other words, he's worried about his profit on his house and he wants to know 
what expenses can he claim that he can use to reduce his tax liability when he gets his money on his his house and pays it off? Well, on 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 a if they've been in the house for two years and it's their primary resident uh, residence, then then they'll be okay. Uh, they have to be in at least two years, and you're allowed to take whatever capital gains you want to take on it and just uh, consult with your CPA. But right. I'm I'm 100 percent sure of that the, the the other thing is if you're less than a year, then what you can do is you can put in all the updates and upgrades that you've done. Uh, I don't believe you're allowed to put in the electricity and things of the water that you used while you were there and all the above. I think it's only part of the upgrade. So let's say you added a deck and a kitchen and a house uh, and it cost $50,000 and the house was bought for three hundred. dollars You have $350,000 in the house and you sell it for $400,000. Then you have $50,000 worth of profit that you have to pay uh, capital gains on tax on, which is now at at 20%, and what I'm understanding is going to go up, uh, uh, is what we're great. being told. Yeah. Um, so so the second thing is on all investment properties, you have to pay, and the same exercise I just told you, uh, but you, you pay that no matter what on, a, on on an investment property when you flip it or sell it. All right. Well, I, I would say you went above and beyond on that for Carl there, Randy. I would tell her, Carl, Definitely check with your accountant because that he, they're, they're oh, going to have the actual, yeah, yeah they're the ones right. Yeah. All right, we are out of time. My uh, my thanks to uh, Randy Rocky at Swan Financial six four five zero seven three six, Kevin Disler Pitt and Frank Attorneys at eight nine five nine nine zero zero. You can reach me. We're looking for homes to list. We've got buyer agents as well to help you buy. You can reach me directly at three seven six five four eight three, and read our reviews at the LouisvilleZillow.com or louisvillesellerstalk.com are some of the videos that we produce with our sellers. Guys, thanks for being here. We appreciate it all. Thanks, Bob. I will see you. Thank you, Bob. Yep, thank you. I'll see you next week on News Radio 840 WHAS.